Amen. Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. That's another, like, top favorite one. Top five. Thank you. Amen. Phil? Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 and verse 1. Mark 2 and 1, the Bible says this, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. Straightway many were gathered together, and so much that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four, four men carrying him, verse 4, and when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, my sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, Now imagine he looks at the palsy man. Now he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Time my message this evening is the friends of a sinner. The friends of a sinner, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, thank you for this account in your gospel. Lord, that shows the compassion that these men had on this man that was not able to get to Jesus on his own. Lord, I pray that you would help us tonight to be the friends to sinners, as you are a friend to sinners, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is one of the best passages in the Gospels. I mean, as a young person growing up in church, I was saved when I was 12 years old, and as a teenager, not very familiar with all the Sunday school stories, I remember this is one of those early sermons that I remember distinctly being the first time I heard it, I think, this, a message preached from this passage, thinking, what, what an occurrence. Now, the Lord also solidified this remembrance in my heart because The church I grew up in had a grand auditorium, and the ceiling was probably even higher than our ceiling in here. And as Pastor Denny Aho was preaching this message, a ceiling tile fell. I mean, literally, right at the perfect exact time, and we thought God God was there. I mean, if there was ever a time, and to this day I can remember, I'll never forget this passage. A ceiling tile literally fell, as we were waiting, someone's coming. Although there, it wasn't packed. The church was kind of empty that night, and people could have come right in the back door. But that was not the case in this passage. You know, the key thought here that the gospel is communicating to us is that Jesus has the authority to forgive sin. And that's what's being illustrated and shown here. And that's why all the rigmarole, that's why all the circumstances of this. But in the midst of this lesson, we see that this palsy man had many friends, chiefly Jesus. Jesus was a best friend, a grand friend to this man of palsy on this particular day, this paralyzed man. Matthew eleven nineteen 19 tells us that Jesus is the friend to sinners. Aren't you glad? 
Aren't you glad that Jesus chooses for himself to be friendly and to be the best friend a sinner could ever have? When a sinner realizes that they have a friend in Jesus, that relationship becomes powerful, life-changing, saving. Beloved, you've never had a greater friend than Jesus. There's no one that's done more for you than Jesus. In a world that highlights and um, elevates the idea of having a, a best friend or, or social awareness of how many likes and how many friends, understand this, that each and every one of you that know Christ as your Savior have a best friend already. And if you might walk this earth lonely, in a state of loneliness, or maybe not have those kind of companions that you would consider the closest of friends, understand this, that you have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And Jesus is your best friend. And maybe you don't know Jesus tonight. Beloved, his invitation to be friendly to you is offered as well. He wants to be your friend. Even though you have nothing to offer to him, even though you have not been friendly to Jesus, Jesus extends the right hand of fellowship to you. See, our sin makes us at enmity with God, makes us our enemies. And who in his right mind is the enemy, is the friend to his enemy? Jesus is, though. And Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for his enemies that he might make them his friends. And to be called a friend of Jesus is an amazing thing. And on this particular day and on, in this particular passage, this man of palsy had four wonderful earthly friends and then he had a chief friend in Jesus. And tonight I want you to see four lessons from the friends of a sinner. Four lessons from the friends of a sinner. Look there at verses 1 through 4. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days and it was noise that he was in the house and straightway many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them, and they came, come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when it, was, had been broke, when it had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. First of all, their concern was greater than their convenience. Their concern for this man was greater than their personal convenience. These men must have loved this man. They literally moved heaven and earth that they might get this man to Jesus. In these short few verses here, talking about these four particular men, they must have loved this man. Their concern was greater than their convenience, and we see in it their compassion. Why, why were they compassionate? Because they did something for someone that could not do it for themselves. Now, this man did not give up much objection. I have, you can insinuate or believe in this passage that if he had the ability to walk, he would have been a part of the throng of people that would have gone to hear Jesus preach the word. But he couldn't. And they, too, were interested to go hear the word. They, they had an attraction or they had uh, 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 whatever it was that was going on that brought everyone to hear Jesus. They wanted to be a part of that. And it would have been very easy for them to say, listen, the crowd is too thick. It's going to be too hard. We're going to have a hard enough time getting to him ourselves, much less having to carry you. But their compassion for their friend was great. And they were willing to even sacrifice their opportunity that they might get close in proximity to the Savior, that they might take their friend with them. Isn't that amazing? What great compassion. What, what, what great compassion. You know, the Bible says in the book of Jude that having compassion, so making a difference. And beloved, there ought to not be more compassionate people than God's people. Because we understand the cost and what's at stake of getting people to it within proximity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, our compassion ought to outweigh our desire for convenience. When was the last time your compassion for someone inconvenienced you? And that's when we begin to really start to minister to people. You see, I'm, I, this is inconvenient. 
to bring this bus kid on my, in my vehicle to take this family out for dinner afterwards. It, it, I have my Sunday plans and I have my schedule and I have the things that I got to do for me and my own. But these individuals, these friends of this sinner, were not more concerned about themselves. They, concluded in their, they included in their concern their concern for their friend. And beloved, you are called to be compassionate and to include others in your time of concern. You know, one of the things about Christmas time and this holiday time that gets so frustrating is how self-focused people become. And it's about preserving your own hallmark moment and about making sure everything is just in place. And we place upon ourselves a great uh, unneeded pressures to have some sort of hallmark moment with ours and our family that we totally forget what's going on around us. Beloved, have some compassion on someone this season. Have some compassion. So you know what? We're, God has blessed us, and we and me and mine are gonna be are gonna do all right this year. We're gonna eat our Christmas ham. We're gonna have a gift or two to share with one another. Why not have a compassionate heart for someone else? See, they had their compassion. These men must have loved this man because we see their compassion, but we also see their challenge. I think, and it's in my heart to understand, that most of us, given the opportunity, would show compassion. But these men were able to go through a challenge to see it all the way through. And notice here, the Bible says the great throng of people, they get to the front door, they're already carrying a man, and through the whole challenge, they said, listen, this challenge, the obstacles are not going to stop us. They, it would have been very reasonable, and I, perhaps even this man, although he might have been pleading with them and, and asking them, no, don't leave me behind, it would have been reasonable for them to say, listen, we can't, we tried, but we can't. We tried, we wanted to, our intentions were right. But when faced with the challenge, they did not stop there. And they began to get a little inventive. They began to think a little outside of the box. This place has a door, we'll make another door. We'll make another way to get him if in proximity of Jesus. We see their compassion, we see their challenge. But we also see a little bit here their chutzpah. I mean, these guys, think about the audacity of what, they were Jewish. It starts with a C. <clears throat> their audacity. I mean, not only did they have compassion, not only did they see a challenge, but these guys had a little bit of gall, a little bit of assertiveness. You know, the rhyme and reason and tradition of the proceedings were not going to stop them from getting someone to Jesus. Their own political correctness. Fear of someone thinking of them weird or audacious was not going to stop them from bringing someone within proximity of Jesus. you got to imagine, they were taking a chance. They didn't know how Jesus was going to respond to this. They, they didn't know if they were going to be rebuked. They didn't know if they were going to be denied. They didn't know they were going to be made an example of. But they knew that the price or the opportunity was great and it was passing them by. And they determined in this point of challenge to have some boldness. Beloved, there is wisdom in the thinking that you ought to preserve your relationships or uh, live your relationships in such a way to provide an opportunity to share the gospel with someone and not ruin the opportunity. You ought to have a good testimony. You ought to have a level of faithfulness so that it builds the fertile ground, particularly in people that you have a continual relationship with. But at a certain point, it's going to take some boldness. At a certain point... You're not going to simply love someone into heaven. And you are not going to feed their physical body into heaven. At some point, you will have to determine to name the name of Christ. And you will have to determine to bring them in within proximity of Jesus himself. And it may require some assertiveness. 
it may require you to act outside of your social norm and the things that you are familiar and comfortable with and be bold for Christ. I guarantee you there is a man walking around in heaven today who was lame upon this earth that was glad that he had some friends that were bold. Had some friends that were not going to be stopped by social decorum and were bold in getting them in proximity to the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, when was the last time you were bold to bring someone into proximity to hear the word of Jesus? Every opportunity, every invite, every sermon series, every special event, these are your opportunities for boldness. To hand the invite card out, to, to ask to use the favor, not for yourself that you've been garnering, but to use the favor of the relationship that they might be able to come and hear Jesus preached. Their concern was greater than their convenience, but secondly, look at verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Second lesson we see here is a person's sin is greater than their symptoms. A person's sin is greater than them, their symptoms. This is, these are not the words that this man or his friends were expecting to hear. Jesus, the problem is obvious. This man cannot walk. The need for a physical physician is his greatest need, but Jesus knew better. Now, there's some idea here that you can ascertain that in this particular case, that this man's uh, condition was related to his spiritual condition. Jesus saw his greatest need. Secondly, a person's sin is greater than their symptoms. A person's greatest need is the forgiveness of sin. Every person... Every lost person, their greatest need is the forgiveness of their sins before God. Jesus knew the man's real problem. They knew his real, Jesus knew this man's real problem. <clears throat> so often, we become satisfied in satisfying a person's symptoms and not truly dealing with their greatest problem. There have been many churches that have become powerless in the gospel because they've become satisfied in propagating a social gospel of simply feeding the hungry and, and helping the poor, which these things ought to be in our repertoire. But those things are to give the opportunity to present a person with their greatest need, their need for the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not why these individuals and this man necessarily came to Jesus, but when confronted, he did not object. Externally, his greatest problem was that he could not walk, but in his heart, he knew he needed the forgiveness of sin. A faithful gospel witness confronts the sinner with his sin. And beloved, until you have done that, until that has taken place, the gospel has not been preached. A cup of cold water, a warm meal, a roof on the head are all good, compassionate things. But they fall far short if an individual is not first, or if an individual is not also shown their greatest need and confronted with their greatest need. Not their homelessness, not their hunger, not their thirst, but their spiritual condition before God. The Bible here illustrates for us that these symptoms are the mechanisms that God uses to get a person to the physician. I've had shared with you some of my uh, dental problems I've had here lately. And a couple of dentist visits back, I had one tooth and the dentist says, does that hurt? And I said, no, it hurt like one night and then it hasn't hurt again. 
She says, well, that should be hurting you really, really bad. And I'm wondering why you were not in my office sooner. See, God had designed that there would be a symptom that would draw me, force me to have to go to the physician. And how cruel is it when someone would present God's people a symptom of something in their life and all we do is give them the solve that will soothe their symptom but never bring them to the physician. You see, the symptoms, the aches, the pains, the warning signs, the hardships, those are all the things that, are, that God, by his providences, have designed in a, the circumstances of a person's life to bring them to the point of understanding their need for a Savior. This is why Jesus says it's hard for a rich man to come into the kingdom. But a poor man, the poor man, that's easy because he understands his need. And, for the, and you, can, you can see in there that the need was created so that he might be able to see his need for the Savior. Beloved, it is spiritually inhumane to soothe a person's symptoms and not show them the cure for their disease. That's spiritually inhumane. And sadly, there are many churches doing just that, feeling that their humanitarian efforts satisfy their gospel calling, and yet they are not faithfully preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you are a sinner, that your sins separate you from God, will send you to an eternity in hell, but Jesus died for your sin that you might be born again and might be saved. Cold water in the name of Jesus is intended to bring the recipient to Jesus. We hear often today that we are to be the hands and feet, quote unquote, of Jesus. And yet it is Christ's desire to seek and to save them that are lost. Secondly, we saw here that a person's sin is greater than their symptoms. But look at verses six through nine, or 5 through 9. The Bible says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy, sons be forgiven, son, thy, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man speak thus, thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in the spirit that they so reason within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts, whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. The third lesson we learn is this. Jesus rewards a confident faith. Jesus rewards a confident faith greater than a critical spirit. There's not a lot of indication that these four friends had a lot of theological understanding of what they were doing. But Jesus rewards their confident faith. I mean, these guys are the definition of optimists. <laughs> they had it in their mind and heart. We don't know what's going to happen, but we do know if we can get him to Jesus, something good will happen. And so they were the optimists. All right. I, I almost wonder, like, if the one guy said, well, well, if he had one friend and he said, well, can you get me there? He says, I can't carry you, but I'll go find three more. And so that friend went and found three more friends, and the four of them got together. And then as they, as they approached the, the, the meeting house and they saw that it was full, they did not say to themselves, oh, it's so full. Can you believe how full it is in here? Where's the handicapped parking around here? Man, don't they have a special ramp entrance to get handicapped people in this place? Wasn't anyone at this meeting here thinking? No, they said no. They were optimists. Well, we're going to push. And so they went, and lo and behold, they didn't need a handicap ramp. They didn't need anything else. They figured out a way to get the bed up on the roof. Who knows how that happened? Listen, I have to believe in the crowd, outside of the scribes, there were some people going, who do those people think they are? How dare they cut in line? How dare they, they get the, the lame guy and get him in front of us? 
But these guys were optimists. And so they get to the top, and, and I wonder if one of them had the thought, this is like destruction of personal property. <laughs> Some suppose that this was Peter's house. Like, Peter may not like this. You know, he built his roof intending for it not to leak, and we're about to put a big bedside hole in it. You can read into this, this, the way that these homes are constructed with multiple layers. I mean, it took some effort to put it this way. The roof was sturdy enough to hold four guys and a lame guy and a bed. So it was, it was a decent roof that they had to dig themselves through. And so these guys had this confident spirit about them, this confident faith. And notice what Jesus says there in verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, Jesus, I, 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 you know, you, you understand that Jesus is preaching. He knows what's happening. He, he, even though the audience inside did not necessarily know what's happening. And as the first uh, chisels uh, of dirt began to fall, Jesus knew what was happening. He knew who these guys were. And you have to believe by his response here, he was humored by it. He was humored by their optimism. He was humored by, this is, oh, that's pretty cool. Look at these guys. I mean, they're really going to do this. And he allowed them to go all the way through. You know, Jesus could have said, hey, uh, Peter, disciples, there's some guys trying to get in over there. Because this is how I would have done it as a pastor. I would say, guys, there's a person, a new person trying to get in the church, and they don't know where to go or the door is locked. What is wrong with you? I've said these words before. Why are we helping them? <laughs> why, are, why isn't someone greeting them? What's wrong with you? But Jesus was humored by this. And they come in and they make their grand entrance. And notice what Jesus does. Jesus rewards the confident faith of the four friends and the man who allowed them to carry him in. Have you ever manipulate or handle someone that's handicapped. I mean, there's an unsureness to that when you can't help yourself. If you drop me, I can't get up. And so it was a five-way partnership to get him in there. Four men who were able to, and one man who was confident to trust his friends to lower him down and not kill him. And Jesus rewards their confident faith. But there's something rewarding and pleasing to God about an optimist. Someone who sees that the cup is half full. Someone who can see challenges and, opportunity, uh, challenges and, and obstacles simply as opportunities for the glory of God. Oh, okay. Well, this, God's, God, the answer to this prayer request is going to even be more glorious because look how hard this is going to be. But look at here as well. Jesus rewards a confident faith greater than than a critical spirit. Jesus review, rebukes the critical spirit of the scribes, even before they had opportunity to say it. And beloved, if you find yourself as a type of person who has, often has a critical spirit, then this is your company. This is who Jesus lumps you in with. This is Jesus' perception of you and your critical spirit. How can he forgive sins? How can he allow this lame man here? Jesus knew it before they said it. Reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? These scribes were full of criticism and in a critical heart. Beloved, if your default setting is criticism, then be convicted. Be convicted. Ask God to change your heart. It's not right. 
your first reaction to any obstacle or inconvenience is criticism, then you are not walking with God as you should be. Let that sit right where it needs to and get right with God. Can you believe what he just said? Your thoughts deceive you. In this topic that we are talking about right here, preaching about, notice that the optimistic faith of these four men led to the salvation of the lame man. A man was one because some optimists determined to believe. A critical spirit never wins anybody. I don't know how many people say, you know, I got saved and I'm a member of the church and I'm loving, loving the Lord and on my way to heaven because, man, that guy's critical spirit just won me over. Man, the way he criticized and, and said how bad things were and how awful, how they never get it right. Man, I, that's the place I got to be. And, you know, I am walking the streets of gold today here in heaven because of that believer's critical spirit. Said no one in heaven ever. Jesus rewards a confident faith greater than a critical spirit. He said, man, but nothing good ever happens around me enough so I can be confident. I, like Pastor Jay, I want to be like that person. It's not about your circumstances. It's about your outlook. It's not about your circumstances. The people around you that are like confident all the time, it's not because they have it easier than you. They're living in the same sinful, deprived world as you are. We remind the kids on the basketball court that the bad refs that are calling it against our team are calling it against their team as well. We're all in the same. The court that is slippery is slippery for everybody. What are you going to do about it? I reminded one player this weekend in a complaint about a ref, I said, well, listen, they're roughing as good about, about as good as you play. <laughs> That's pretty good. I mean, listen, don't expect more out of them than we're expecting out of ourselves. That might have been harsh. That's what we're whispering when y'all are watching over there. <laughs> Jesus rewards a confident faith greater than a critical spirit. But lastly, look at verse 10. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, verse 11, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose and took up the bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were, were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Lastly, number four, fourth lesson, the power to forgive sin is greater than the ability to fix sickness. Jesus here proclaims his messianic title, the Son of Man. This is the first of 16 uses that he will use it here in the Gospel of Mark. 60 plus times used throughout all four Gospels. He says here that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sin. Later on in verse 28, he says the Son of Man has authority over the Sabbath day. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath day. In using this title, he is claiming for himself the messianic title prophesied by Daniel. He is declaring himself the Messiah. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13, the Bible says, And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Jesus knew exactly the words he was saying to these scribes. And he understood that these scribes, these, 
those that were responsible for copying God's word and then interpreting it or teaching it to the people would understand what he was saying. Later on in this same gospel, Mark 8, 31, he'll say, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed after three days, rise again. And Jesus here in this action, before even determining to heal this man's physical ailments, but offering him the forgiveness of sin, declares himself the Son of God. Declares himself God himself. And the scribes knew it. Because what did they say? Who can forgive sin but God? Is he claiming to be God? And he replies to them, the Son of Man. Yes, I am God. God has given men the ability through knowledge and technology to cure some of our greatest ailments. We've cured some of the diseases that ravish mankind. We've allowed, through technology and medicine, the life expectancy of people to increase. For the most part, most people in the civilized world live longer than their predecessors. But there's only one person who has the authority and the ability to forgive sins, and he is not the Pope, and he does not live in Rome. Jesus is the only person that can forgive you of your sins. And his ability and authority, the Bible, or power to forgive sins is greater than the ability to fix sickness. So at the end of this passage, Jesus, to prove a point, heals the lame man to prove his authenticity and his ability to forgive sin. Jesus fixes the man's sickness to prove his power. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 39, but he answered and said unto them, an evil an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jesus realized that they weren't going to believe him by his authority alone, and so he does this to show the scribes up. And beloved, we have to understand, or the lesson that we learn here, that the greatest thing that Jesus can do for you and I, above fixing our bank account, above fixing our relationships, above fixing our health. The greatest thing that Jesus has done for you is forgiven you your sin. And beloved, if given the choice of the forgiveness of your sins or the restoration of your body, it is the person who knows the word of God that he will take the forgiveness of sin every single time. This is why death has no dominion over us. This is why the grave does not have fear over us because we have the forgiveness of sin and we have a right standing before God. This man with palsy sure had some great friends. Four friends that brought him to Jesus, but his greatest friend was Christ himself. Perhaps one of these lessons is what needs to be applied in your life tonight. Heavenly Father, would you help us? But we understand that this is for our own edification. Or perhaps we need to be convicted of our concern over our convenience or our boldness in declaring the gospel or our confident faith as opposed to our critical spirit and our thankfulness for your forgiveness of sins in our lives. Lord, would you use this in our lives? We ask these things.